Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we are going through the book of John. We're, we are still in the middle of John chapter 12. So what's been going on in this chapter? Well, we're in the last week of Jesus's life. Jesus has been anointed for burial by Mary of Bethany. Uh, we've had the triumphant entry where Jesus came into town riding on a donkey where everybody's praising his name. And then now Jesus is, is teaching his disciples. And uh, we left off after, G after Jesus spoke to the Father and said, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came back saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And Jesus says to them, hey, this voice didn't come on account of me. It came for your sake so that you may know that everything I say is true. So when we left off, um, I'm going to start uh, in verse 32. I think this is where we left off. Or I'll, I'll start in verse 30 here. So Jesus answered and said to them. So uh, they've just heard a voice from God. Jesus answered and said to them, excuse me, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Now Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says lifted up? Uh, too many people think that lifted up means exalted. We say that, you know, high and lifted up, exalted Jesus. No, what Jesus is referring to when he says, if I be lifted up, he's referring to crucifixion. And we actually know this because if you go back to John chapter 3, when uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, it's right around verse 14. Uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believe in him will have eternal life. So the word lifted up here, and John tells us that, it's, it's signifying what death he would die. Lifted up means death by crucifixion. Um, Jesus also said this. So this is signifying by what death he would die. Jesus is going to die. He knows he's going to die, but he's still 100% in control of everything that's going to happen. Clear back in the Old Testament, it's Psalm 22, 16. It was prophesied that the Messiah would die on a cross. Crucifixion hadn't even been invented back then. But if you go back to Psalm 22, 16, uh, David says, they, they pierced my hands and my feet. That they, they cast uh, lots for my garments. It was all prophesied back in the Old Testament. So Jesus is in complete control. But he's going to have to go through these things. So verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? So they know that he's referring to crucifixion. Who is this son of man? So what are they referring to here when they say, well, we, we've heard that the Messiah is going to remain forever. Well, there's a couple of verses back in the Old Testament that this would be alluding to. Um, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 9, where it says, you know, unto us a son is born, unto us, uh, I'm close there, unto us a son is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So they would be referring back to that Isaiah 9 uh, seven verse. Also in, in Daniel chapter seven, where it says, I saw one like the ancient of days coming on the clouds of heaven and uh, of his dominion, it'll be an everlasting dominion. So th that would be the Old Testament verses with, that they would be referring to that when they say, hey, we've heard that the Christ remains forever. Now you're telling us he's going to be crucified. How does this work? Let's keep going. Let's look here. Verse 34, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever and how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? This is another thing I wanted to talk about here. Son of man, that, that is Jesus's favorite way to refer to himself. 82 times in the gospel, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. And if, if you go back to verse 23 of chapter 12 here, that's what it says. Jesus answered them saying, the, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Why does Jesus refer to himself as the son of man? Is that not a good question? Well, there's two answers here. First, it says, it's back in that Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel's vision of the, of the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. He says, I saw one like the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. 
So Jesus is using the same wordage that Daniel used. So he's referring to himself saying, I am that ancient of days that will come on the clouds of heaven. Um, the second reason I think Jesus refers to himself as son of man all the time, it's because of his humanity. We need to remember this. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. And, and we have to hold both of those viewpoints in our mind. And we know that right back in the beginning of John here. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Jesus was fully God. But then you go to John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, he was fully God to be worshiped like God, but he was also fully man. I think when he said, always refers to himself as son of man, he's referring to himself as, as, a, as his humanity. Verse 35, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So Jesus says, hey guys, I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. So what? how are we supposed to take that? We have to believe on Jesus while the light is there. God said, my spirit will not strive with man forever. Um, Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When a movement is God, of God is happening, we have to act. I believe it's in the book of Samuel where it says, um, the, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It's, it's in the book of Amos, I believe chapter 7, where, where God says, hey, I'm going to send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or of water, but of hearing the word of God. So we have to ask ourselves, is there a famine of hearing the word of God? Is the word of God rare in our days? Or are there just people not wanting to listen to it? And is that why it's rare? I say all this, when a movement of God is happening, we have to act. The, the last thing we can ever say to God is, you know, I'm not now, I, I'm busy, later. No, absolutely not. So Jesus is saying, hey, walk while you have the light. I'm here right now. Verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. So, first off, it says, he did so many signs before them. Think of everything Jesus did to, to confirm that he was the Christ. I think in the Gospels we find 34 miraculous things, miracles that Jesus did to confirm that he was the Christ. What more could he have done? He raised people from the dead and still they reject him. He was the only person in, he, he is the only person in human history to fulfill all the prophecies wrote by the Messiah. So with all these signs, the, the people should have, they all should have said, this is the one. We're going to worship and praise him. He, he is our, my, our Messiah, but they rejected him. And John explained that is because, hey, it was prophesied. So he quotes two Old, pas Old Testament passages from the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 53, 1 and Isaiah 6, 10 that he quotes here. Now, when it says that they could not believe, what does that mean? Does that mean, well, that it was predestined? They weren't going to believe. They had no choice. No, Jesus said this about Judas. Judas, it was predestined. He said, you know, uh, my close friend will betray me. It was going to happen all along. But that doesn't mean anybody's without excuse. Jesus said, woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. It had been good for him if he had not been born. So what these guys have is actually the unpardonable sin. Jesus talked about the unpardonable sin. It's in Matthew chapter 12 where he says, whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit it will not be forgiven him. And what is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It's continued rejection of the word of God, which has been revealed to you. Because what more, what more could Jesus have done? We are creatures of habit. We have to remember this. And if we continually reject God, it's just going to keep becoming easier. So it was prophesied in the Old Testament that they would not believe, but that does not mean that they were without excuse. And it's that way today. If someone today is not a follower of Jesus, they're simply denying the evidence. Let's keep going. Verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he, when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. 
But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. This is a tragic verse of scripture, is it not? Are, are there really people more concerned about what, what men think of them than what the one true God of the universe, what his opinion is of them? Um, you know, are there people that say, boy, I'd love to live, give my life to Christ, but what would my friends and my family think? Here's a good question. Can somebody be a secret disciple of Jesus Christ? Can somebody be a secret follower? William Barclay, he, he was a Scottish theologian and uh, he writes a lot of commentary. He had a great, great quote about this. William Barclay said, either the discipleship kills the secrecy or the secrecy will kill the discipleship. We have to remember that. You know, these people, what did they want? The praise of men more than the praise of God. Should we have one worry about what men think of us? No. One day we will all stand in judgment before the Son of God. Are we ever going to have to stand in judgment before men? Maybe, but it'll be temporary. Let's keep going. Verse 44. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Now, starting in verse 44, just this little paragraph right here. These are Jesus' last words of public teaching. This is the last time he's going to address the public crowds. Um, he will address his disciples after this, and he will talk to Pilate. But this is his last public discourse right here. So verse 44, then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. This is a another verse of Jesus claiming equality with God. In just a couple short chapters, we're going to be in John chapter 14. And Philip's going to say to Jesus, say, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus is going to say, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And people might say, oh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It might not be, but, but the idea of it is absolutely in here. Jesus is claiming equality with God. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen him who sent me. You've seen the Father. Verse 46, I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Verse 47, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, now this is a... A little bit of a puzzling verse because Jesus earlier said, you know, all authority and judgment has been given unto me. Jesus is the judge. He is the one we will all stand before, but that's not the reason that he came. We have to remember that. Why did he come? To save the world. Uh, it's We all know John 3.16, but John 3.17 says, For God did not come to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. At, at the next coming, at the second coming of Jesus, he will judge the world. But the reason for his first coming was to show us the way of salvation so that we can be found right with God to die on a cross for our sins. He didn't come to judge the world, but he is the judge and he will judge the world. All right, verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. If you reject Jesus, you bring the condemnation on yourself. It's John 3.36. John the Baptist says, he who believes in the Son will have everlasting life. Isn't that great? But he who does not believe will not see light, but the wrath of God abides in him. There, there are only two paths to take. Jesus told us that in the Sermon on the Mount. There's the wide gate and the broad way, which leads to destruction. And there's the narrow path through the narrow gate, which leads to everlasting life. There's only two paths, and they each go their way. There are no other paths than that. Verse 49. For I have not come on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. God does not delight in the death of a sinner. God does not delight in bringing wrath. What, what is his command? It's everlasting life. That it, the Bible tells us that, that God desires all to be saved. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Every word Jesus said was from authority, from the Father. Every word Jesus spoke was the golden word of God. And uh, guys, we're done with chapter 12. We're going to start chapter 13 next week. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.